Dan's in another room. So. <clears throat> In the status quo in many countries, there is a norm that students take on large debt burdens in order to pay for university up front. Instead of this, we would prefer a norm where individuals and students are charged as a percent of their income. So for example, a university would basically have a royalty on their earnings post-graduation as compared to that. So on our side of the house, people are paying what they earn as a percentage. On their side of the house, they are paying as a percentage or some form of the debt burden that they incurred when they attended joint university. Let's move into the arguments that we brought you. First, we're going to explain how this is actually morally just. Second, how it increases and encourages education and specialized education. Third, and finally, though, the cores of the debt. First, why this is justified. So importantly, college is actually characterized by large amounts of uncertainty. You don't know whether you'll do well or poorly for somewhat obvious reasons. Life is an unexpected, traverse, scary place, especially universities. So, in these cases, we would say that although the people had engaged in mutually beneficial transactions beforehand, e.g., they went to a university and said, I would like to take out a large debt burden in order to finance my, is it a clarification or a pupil? Actual clarification. What's up, dude? Uh, given the motion says tuition, and that tends to refer to the total amount of money you have to pay, why are you able to say that the total amount you pay is the same, just that the amount you pay each individual year post fact to pay off the debt you've incurred to the university is lower? So the tuition that, right, that you're being charged is just as a percent based on student income post-graduation. Therefore, we do that because you're, what you pay is based on that. You can't pay it after like 20 years. We forgive it and forget about it. With that, moving into what I was talking about before. First, we think that this is, in principle, justified and important. Because of the way that the world is characterized by such large uncertainties, we want to prioritize the people who, for, that, that, for, for whom that is the worst. Because when you move to college, although you may have these ideas, incentives about what a job may be like, college may be like, you may not necessarily have the same outcomes. But as a result, I think we have a far better society for that. Therefore, we don't have a problem with necessarily uh, colleges not being financed in this way. We can also have the government step in and make sure people actually go to the college in the very first place if there's a problem with college reporting. Second thing then, the most important thing, is encouraging education. The first thing that happens on our side of the house is that people are far more educated. This is because in the status quo, many people are hesitant to go to university in the very first place. Because as I described before, university and the job market, the labor market overall, is characterized by large amounts of uncertainty. First, the business cycle is really flexible, so you're unsure of whether or not the job that you get will be in demand at a given moment. So given that there is a large cost, i.e. a high fixed debt burden, you are unlikely or unwilling to engage in certain jobs or go to university to get skills in the first place if you think there is a risk that you will not be able to pay that off because say that job is no longer in demand in 10 or 20 years, especially given the rate of technological growth in the status quo 21st century, this is especially important and, uh, especially important and prevalent. The second large uncertainty, though, is that you don't know what you may do in college. So you may end up taking out this debt burden and doing really poorly in college and then dropping out after one year. But nonetheless, despite not having the benefits of a job because you haven't earned a skill by finishing a degree, you actually still have to pay off some large portion of debt. That wouldn't happen on our side of the house, or it would happen at least proportional to your income. So if you have a really low-wage job because you weren't productive for like productive in the output per hour sense, then what happens is that you actually don't have to pay off massive debt burden unless you go back to school, get educated, get skills, and can move into higher wage employment. But the second thing that happens is people get far more freedom and ability to choose where they go to, where they go after the university. So in the status quo, because of the high cost of going to university, people are often unwilling to go into sectors that are especially either low skill but have societal value or personal value or go into sectors where there isn't clearly profit incentives, such that wages there are very high. So although it is not the most socially utile form of employment, we know that the vast majority of graduates from really prestigious schools in places like the United States go into finance and consulting rather than other socially utile places, like say, in government or nonprofit sectors, because in the case of government, there is an actual private market for labor, instead there is one employer who gets to decide your wages, so can't properly value them because they have other considerations. But second, in the case of nonprofits, there's literally no profit incentive to push up wages for the best talent compared to really high, high profitable and lucrative, uh, lucrative professions. Before that, I move on, I'll take a POI from someone. Yeah, I mean, so you're propping the UK system, which is not what this debate is about. There are many ways in which this could play out. You can't just choose one world, one, one way in which it could play out. I chose it, so actually, I did. <laughs> next argument I want to bring you. Like, I don't think that, right, like, the motion clearly specifies we charge tuition as a percent of graduate income. This is what we do. Maybe it's the UK system. 
Wunderbar. Awesome. Sounds like a great time. Next argument I want to bring you, though, is about how this actually, and it impacted what I was discussing before, about actually incentivizing proper modes of employment. So now people can move into socially utile jobs. So in some cases, this is things like government or nonprofits, but often it is things which are personally liberating. So there are plenty of things which may not add societal value, but nonetheless add value to an individual's life. For example, uh, academia would be a great example of this. So something that is very personally fulfilling for individuals, but may not actually provide the most social value. So in these cases, we're able to optimize people's ability to survive on our side of the house. Third and finally is about the problems of debt. So as I described before, the business cycle is particularly uncertain. You don't know whether you're going to have a job at any given moment. However, debt burdens are fixed. In those cases, even though you may not have a job at any given moment, you're nonetheless paying a fixed debt burden such that you actually have to pay regardless whether or not you have a job or have a high income or one that is proportional to it. In those cases, then, what happens to individuals? Uh, the first is that they can easily go bankrupt. So, they, so those who took out the loan, or at least on their behalf, like the government, can seize collateral that they posted for that loan, which can include really vital things. So for example, homes are often used really critically in, loans for, in, in student loans to be able to access credit to go to university. But in a lot of cases, it's other assets. So for example, uh, securities that someone might have on which they can actually make sure their lives are, uh, which like pay dividends, bring them income. In the case of homes, though, it's especially bad because then you no longer have uh, a home, place to live, totally, totally screwed. Uh, the other thing that happens, though, is that there are really large harms to your ability to access credit in the future because you can no longer, because now you have a poor credit history as a result of defaulting on debt. So now you can't actually access credit to say, go to university again, get a education, maybe move into a more high skill, therefore more highly paid profession. But in a lot of cases, what happens if people don't go bankrupt is that they nonetheless cut back massively on other types of spending that they could do otherwise. So for example, going to graduate school can't happen if you have to, in the status quo, pay back large amounts of debt from your undergraduate degree. So you aren't able to specialize more fully, which would earn you a higher income. This is totally possible on our side of the house where earnings are charged as a percentage of a given in individual's income rather than just as the cost of tuition, as it is the case in many places. For these reasons and many more, have to focus. So I thank the speaker for those remarks and call upon the leader of the opposition. Tuition is the total amount of money you will pay for attending your university. The total amount. This is critical because what they're supporting is not the total amount you pay. It's paying it in smaller installments over a longer period of time because they're saying you pay percent of your income towards whatever your total amount of money is that you're paying to your university. That is not the policy. I know you want to support the UK policy because it's easier for you, but that is not the debate. They have to support you paying less total money sure, back sure. to the university rather than just paying it back in smaller installments based on the income you make over every sure, single sure. year. This is critical because there are many other alternatives that already exist in the status quo. There's ones like doing free university. There's ones like doing the policy that they think is the debate that isn't actually the debate, which is paying a percentage of your income every year towards some set total. There's things like the US model that they clearly oppose but miss the fact that this is not what the majority of Western states in the world even do. And there's things like really low subsidized rates for poor individuals, which is something that Canada does. The reason why this is so critical, this is really important, because all Western states in the world are moving towards attempting to make university systems easier. It is and easier to attend. It's one of the most popular political reforms, especially to the education system, that is being pushed in modern Western states. This means that the future on our side of the house is a future in which there are targeted policies to help poor individuals attend university to make sure that they don't incur those massive debt burdens, that these alternatives will inevitably occur in the long run. This means that the comparative in this debate is not between current status quo America and their policy, but between a broad trend to increase involvement in university on our side versus their specific policy. I'm going to show you in my speech why their policy is horrible for the very people that they care about, why it decreases poor people's involvement in universities in the most high-income professions, why that's bad. Uh, before that, yeah. 
So given the fact that even in places like Canada or Germany where tuition is free, it's still a tremendous cost that you can only invest so much money into universities without the taxpayers just refusing to give more, isn't it better that we have a progressive taxation on those who benefit the most from university, giving back to it more, so low-income people can go for less amounts? Like, I'm not guaranteeing that low-income people will go for less. So I know a lot of incredibly rich people going to Cambridge who could pay ludicrous amounts of money to go to university, but are taking things like theology or some <laughs> random English program. They can be progressively taxed and pay bucket loads of money, even though they're not going to make much after university, while the poor person who's going into a high-paying job can therefore pay less. We can do progressive taxation systems without this policy. I want to look at the actual effect this has on what courses students choose on their side of the house. We think it's absolutely abhorrent. Firstly, recognize that because universities will now get less money for every single non-high paying profession uh, place that they have. So for instance, they will get paid less money to have someone study English than they will get paid for them to study a STEM field because STEM fields tend to make more money post-university. The incentives of every single university institution is to cut back on any liberal arts program that doesn't pay massive amounts of money post-graduation. This is because if they don't do this, their budgets plummet and they have a lower ability to actually provide for any of their students at all. They have to cut professors, they have to cut parts of their administrative infrastructure, which are things they just categorically do not want to do, given that this means often cutting their jobs or the jobs of their friends and associates. Why is this so harmful? Firstly. Not everyone is cut out to be a scientist. Not everyone wants to pursue a life in those professions. Here's what's critical as well. Some people want to go in to social work and help people in the long run. But the thing is the point at which you cut the total number of positions available in universities, they can never even get the opportunity to get into that form of employment in the first place. They just have a harder time going to any level of prestigious university that's able to offer them that more soft degree that they think that they value on their side of the house. This is really critical, because it means that if they want a progressive system, they do the exact opposite. Because when you cut the total number of positions available for any kind of particular profession, it's going to advantage those in society with the most pre-existing privilege. The wealthy individuals who went to good private schools and thus on average have higher grades are going to be advantaged over the poor people who come from comparatively worse schools, which means that the poor individuals who do not want to be going into those high paying jobs, who want to help people, who want to take lower paying professions, have significantly a harder time even getting on the academic ladder to do so in the first place on their side of the house, and they get significantly more available to those who are privileged. Secondly, we think that this often gives you an incentive to pursue a low paying job post-university. Because if you take that low paying job post-university, this means that you are going to pay less. And this seems to be an appealing option for individuals. The thing is that this is an irrational choice in the long term. And the reason why it's an irrational choice is those lower paying professions mean that a decade, 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, when you would have been free from your university debt anyway in most states, you are still stuck in a lower paying profession, a lower paying career path. Which means that a short term decision decides the rest of your life on their side of the house and you are pushed into making this particular choice in an irrational way that we think is particularly harmful. It means you don't go into the law firm and you become an associate because you're wanting to pay less in the short term. This means that 20 years, 30 years down the line, you're not the managing partner. That's particularly harmful. Yep. There is already an incentive for colleges and universities to specialize and fund better high income programs because people will be willing to pay larger sums in tuition for high paying like, programs. This is maybe only true of the United States. The UK has a flat tuition for everyone who attends their universities and thus this is not true at all. Given most countries in the world are moving towards that type of tuition system, I think it's reasonable for us to say that the future looks more like that than the weird system that exists within the United States. Thirdly. Recognize that this also screws over university budgeting. Because no university knows how much they're going to make from any individual student. Because it is wholly dependent on how much money they make at the end of the day. This means that your university funding stream is incredibly volatile and is probably likely to be on average lower. Why is this harmful? Because the way in which you deal with this lower stream of funding is to cut places, to attempt to limit expenses to the largest degree possible. This is really harmful because it means that less total positions are even available in universities in the first place to provide people the academic degrees they, they need to be able to succeed in modern society. 
The point at which this is true is the point at which you don't actually provide more people access to education, the point at which you deny it to the very people who need it the most. This is what you have to recognize at the end of my speech. The world is moving towards the exact progressive system they want, but one that it doesn't screw over the poor by leading to less positions for the exact things that they want, and one that actually provides you the incentive to get a high paying, good job post university. Thank the speaker for those marks. Now call upon the deputy prime minister. Three things. First on the model, second on why this is justified, and third on social consequences. So the first thing, on the model. These guys just don't listen to Xavier when he's talking, right? Here's the thing. The model's pretty simple, right? We're going to tax people for the same number of years, for instance, 15 to 20 years, whatever that number is, we're going to tax a percentage of their income. So if you're in like management consulting, or if you're in a hedge fund, right, you'll get taxed 15% of a really high income. If you're in social work, you'll get taxed 15% of a lower income. That's how the tuition changes. I don't know why Cambridge made so, so many like descriptors. I'm sorry, I don't think that's how we're from. Second question, yeah. moving on. So, to why this is justified, right? We tell you that uniform payments are unjustified. We get very little engagement with this, right? Number of reasons why this is the case. As Abe explains to you, people get different levels of access to university education in the first place, right? So even if you go to the same university, that doesn't mean that you access the resources to the same degree. So for instance, a lot of the correlation between individuals who are able to access later high paying professions like management consulting or investment banking, often were grown like, like born into like richer families or upper middle class individuals and had the ability to understand what those like social interactions, played golf on the weekends, so that they were able to network with these individuals, right? Those people are also able to make a lot more use of the access of the resources that those universities provide in the first place, right? The a lot of other individuals though, who come from lower income backgrounds and often do correlate to going into places like you know social work or have a stronger incentive to do that, they don't get the same access to those university resources. That means they shouldn't have to pay to the same degree, right? On our side of the house, we change that by saying that the people who use the resources the most should be the ones who foot the bill the most. But the second principle on a level of the principle analysis here is to know that if you have a stronger ability to pay later in life, we tend to tax you on a societal level at higher rates as well, right? We're happy to say that those richer individuals down the line should have to foot the bill of the university as well. On a principled level then, this policy is justified. Very little engagement from them. So, lastly then, <laughs> let's talk about the social consequences. So, a number of things here, no thing. First, Note that on a principle, like, they guys keep laughing, but like, can't sit down. So, note, right, first of all, we massively incentivize the number of lower income individuals to go into university, right? And every time that these guys say that university spots will get cut, like, maybe they'll get cut from, like, the most elite universities, which is unlikely because those universities have things like endowments and, like, run most of their money through endowments and have things like charity donations from a lot, or, like, you know, alumni donations from people who do earn a lot of money, right? Because they want a name on the wall for, like, they're, they're a name on the wall, right? So, CF, like, you know, Steve Schwartzman, like donating $150 million to universities that he's been to, right? The difference then, though, is a question of which side is able to help the lowest off individuals, the worst off individuals, by providing them with the resources to go to university. We say that is our side. What's the like, pro like you know, basically fee up from up? They say, well, the thing is, a lot of places have like, you know, things like free education, and we're moving towards that, right? Number of things. First of all, recall that Dan Lahav told you that you can't just fee up things that aren't the status quo. The fact that there is free university Sorry. right now does not mean that this will be uniformly accessible to everyone. Second of all, note that there's a huge amount of pushback against the idea of free education and supporting poorer individuals if those poorer individuals then don't have to pay like, as high taxes when they go into higher paying professions. And third of all, note right that when universities 
universities, even if they do provide some level of uniform payment, right, typically they average it across individuals, right? So elite institutions don't say, well, you don't have to pay anything. They say, my tuition fee is going to be $60,000 for everybody, and that's a higher level of payment that a lot of poor individuals can't access. And it's the same for state schools, they might ch charge less money, but it's still a huge barrier to individuals who do come from lower, like lower socioeconomic backgrounds, right? Before that, yes. Uh, Given this issue of fiat is in this debate, why can you fiat a specific version of this world that you would like, rather than what is the most likely world that would develop on your side? Yeah, Gov gets fiat power, that's going to be the argument there. That's it, right? Pretty reasonable. So, moving back to why we help the lowest of individuals, right? Note that the current barrier for the vast majority of people isn't that there aren't enough university spots. The fact that there are a lot of community colleges, for instance, that do provide, like, like that literally take anybody who applies. A lot of state schools do apply, do, do take a vast number of individuals, right? The barrier then is that a lot of people can't afford to go to those universities. That is to say that if you know your debt burden will be $15,000 or $20,000 and you're not sure that the job market after the, if you go to university will accept you and give you a sufficient job that means that you can actually go in and go in and make money and actually like come out better off through university, that means a lot of individuals choose not to go to university. What does this look like? This looks like the like, poorest individuals in society saying, I have money right now, if I go and work in a fast food restaurant, that money is going to definitely come towards me. Whereas if I go to university, I have to take three or four years off time, and that's lost, that's like lost income during that time. But secondly, that I then get a debt burden that I might not be able to pay off. Those individuals get locked out of university, right? We change that by saying that we push these individuals into university and tell them that they will not have a debt burden unless they can actually get a job, and that that job will only be taxed at the level of income that they get. Why is this more important than their analysis? Because we help the worst off in society who have no alternative and who aren't getting support by the free education they say on their side of the house, right? So, closing, do you have a POI? Okay, that's right. No, not yet. I'll give you 30 seconds closing. I'll ask you five then. So, then, what happens though once these individuals do go to university, right? Post-university, they're not given that debt burden in the first place. That means that they don't go through the things like low credit ratings and bankruptcies that Xavier explains that we get very little engagement from, right? So first of all, it means we're pushing more individuals into university, giving them the education that actually helps. And second of all, it means that they're not getting like debt burdens down the line. But the third thing to note here, right, is that now universities cater towards the individual needs of these people, right? They're far more likely to provide you know, resources for those individuals to be able to gain access to jobs down later down the market that arms them with useful skills rather than just skills that like might sound good for an individual. Individual, but actually answer with tangible skills so that they can get a job as an accountant at a small local firm in their local neighborhood, right? All of those things, closing to your POI. Um, right. so, yeah. yeah, closing? No, don't worry. Opening? Okay. Uh, your policy allows a rich kid who's studying English to go to university for pennies, whilst a poor lawyer or engineer pays bucket loads after they graduate. How is this a progressive system? Sure. Two responses to this. First of all, it is true that maybe some rich kids will get up on our side of the house, but disproportionately, it's less likely that that will happen in the first place, because most rich people tend to be correlated with the types like social upbringing that leads them into roles like investment banking and management consultant, right? On a weighing level, weigh the individuals who are worst off in society over the people who are going to be very well off and might get off scot free off like a few number of cases. But the second thing to note is that these guys keep talking about law school as if that's a possibility for people who didn't access things like, you know, like proper, like, you know, like good education secondary school, right? A lot of those individuals aren't the types of people who are going to be going into law school later down the line and getting the best investment banking jobs out there, right? So these guys are in a fantasy land that only favors the most elite institutions, forgetting about the fact that there are other institutions out there that do preference poorer individuals and are able to provide poorer individuals with that level of access. Last argument we get from opening opposition is just that, well, now social work will like no longer be offered by universities, right? First of all, note, this is not necessarily the case to the extent that social work still earns some level of income, and if you can get a lot more people into social work because there's a lot more demand for that, that's still exists. Second of all, note that universities won't just cut entire departments because they still get things like alumni donations that those, those alumni can say, use this in the way that you like. Because we get a more principled system, because we help the worst off in society, we're very proud to propose. I thank the speaker for those remarks and now call upon the deputy leader of the opposition to continue the debate. justify your world is the most likely to occur. E.g., if we can prove to you that their system will lead to universities going bankrupt because they can't determine how much money will go into their system, which means they have to pursue the other world we talk about, 
then that argument will not play out in theory because universities will not do that. It's not like this house would push it. I, I've the HWS are rubber shout outs. I've seen Michael Nishish, the ACE and Alex do this in the previous one, so I assume that it is true. So, two things we do in this speech. Firstly, world one, opening girls' world. Secondly, world two, our world, why it's more likely and why that world is more harmful. World one, opening government's world. This is when you pay it back as a percentage of your income, and OGTA is good because it stops giant debt burdens. What we know is that if you want to stop giant debt burdens, there are a bunch of ways to do that that are more targeted and more effective that achieve all the outcomes. Also, side note, things, one of them is just progressive taxation in general, right? Which is basically what they want to do. Opening up just say progressive taxation is their model. So you could progressively tax people in society and then they pay more tax to the state and give more money to poor people through state systems. Secondly, you can do things like have financial aid, you can do things like have government subsidization, you can do things like have scholarships. These, this is the status quo in a lot of cases, and in cases when it's not, they aren't going to get the outcomes that they want. But why is our world so bad? Because in that world, you are paying on a cost, on a, on a needs basis, right? You are saying, this person has X financial difficulties, therefore we lower their tuition. Whereas in our world, you massively incentivize people to go into lower pay professions, they pay less debt back. They say this only happens for a few people. We have a better system than this in the, in the UK, and a lot of people do go into those lower paid professions afterwards. Why? Because those are often in, to get into, if you're an, an art student, to almost any, uh, like, I know, prestigious job, you have to go and work for an NGO, you want to work for the UN, you've got to go for a free unpaid internship. If you want to go into a bunch of jobs that are fun or interesting, like academia, whatever, you often have to go through those low salaries. You gigantically incentivize people to do that more on their side of the house when you're paying back a lower amount. The second thing, though, is because of this, universities have way less money because the post getting a guaranteed amount of money, if people are incentivized to go into positions where they pay a lot less back, they are fucked. How does the UK fix this problem? Uh, it's nice to talk about my country. Um, we have mass government subsidization, so the government fills in the gaps in those situations when people aren't paying back as much as they should be paying back. Why is that a problem? Because they can't be at government subsidization on top of this, which means a system without government subsidization paying more money when students are paying less back to their universities means that universities have way less money to play with. Not only that, but if someone switches their career, your amount of income decreases rapidly. So there's an economic crisis or something, right? And then people's incomes drop giantly. The university have already put this money out for you, but now they have no money to get back and no money to reclaim from you in this situation. Why, as opposed to, which you might do in an upfront tuition thesis, System, where that money's already for you. Why is it so bad? So universities are now put out that money, but have less money back. They go bankrupt. They find no places for anyone. This is why this world is very unlikely to occur, because you would never agree to allow people to pay something back based on an ideological principle. You do it based back on being able to get money. But what other things could they do? Firstly, they just collapse university places. Secondly, they only provide programs that can guarantee will get them money back. They only provide high income, high generating programs. What is the problem with that? Firstly, a lot of people don't have the qualifications to enter in the first place. Some programs are normally harder to get into and have a higher barrier to get into because you have to have so much more specialist knowledge versus a university program, like a liberal arts program in the first place. That hurts the poor who are now forced to go in subjects where their school teaching standards may not have been high enough. Often you can teach yourself some things for liberal arts. You can study books on your own. It's really hard to teach yourself those subjects. But secondly, you force people to make a coercive choice about their education at a super early age. They, they have to choose, choose to go to those programs because those are the only ones available. The other thing I think happens is that universities hugely decrease student spending in advance because they can't guarantee how much money they're going to get back. They massively decrease that spending, meaning you get a much worse university system. Because of like, the outcome of this, though, is bankruptcy. You spend more because then you're going to get back in the future. I think this world doesn't happen. I think our second world is more likely to happen. Question. World two. This is a higher rate for certain subjects. Note the wording of the motion. The motion does not say a percentage of income, it says earnings after graduation. So I think what's more likely is they go, here is the average amount that a student will earn in the future, here is the, therefore we're going to set salaries of going situation based on that. So they say we're going to charge you $40,000 a year for a STEM subject and $20,000 a year for liberal arts programs. Why is that so bad? Because firstly, the rich get richer, because now the rich are the only people who can afford to go into professions that will pay them more money, because they've got a higher upfront cost in the first place, going to deter a fuckload of people. If you you want to solve inequality? Oh, I'll take one of my two POIs now, sorry. Yep, closing. How is this different from public pension plans where you use the money currently coming in to budget for future like investments in pensions? Well, with pension plans, you, you're paying them in advance, right? So you're not getting the money straight away, you're paying that, you're paying that in advance to get right. access to it. Or the state steps in to subsidize and pay for it. But in these situations, the state is not stepping in, you can't guarantee the state will step in. So, okay. 
Firstly, the rich get richer, only the rich can afford to do that. Secondly, universities only provide places for very, very rich students and very rich subjects. So you therefore get fewer liberal arts places that are going to get you less revenue. I'll take my second PY now, someone's got a promoting. Okay? Yeah. Cool. So you say people will go into lower paying jobs. If we get more qualified people moving away from investment banking and going into teaching or government, that's going to make things more socially productive and help society at a better rate. No, I said that you incentivize people to go into lower paying jobs, which will be like internships, which will be fancy jobs, very, very rich people. I think you, you change the incentives for a poor person anyway. Uh, so, third thing that you do, you trap people into, into a profession where they have to uh, stick there for the rest of their life because they've now got this tuition bill they have to pay, and therefore they can't switch at a future date. That binds people into a choice they made at an incredibly young age, but also forgets the fact that you could start off with a your profession could have a high predicted career income, but then you as an individual could not ever accrue that for circumstances bond you into control. So if you had like a mental health problem, for example, when you have to drop out of university for a bit, you've now got this giant bill you have to pay, but you can no longer pay any more. That was an unfair system. But the fourth thing is that you force people into these subjects because now we say these are going to be the only kind of like less competitive subjects because universities have massive incentives to provide them. So there's going to be way more options for them. That means that only the less qualified people, people get into those professions in the first place because there are more options open. But also you're forced into them if you want to go to university at all, which the barrier we say isn't fair. But the fourth thing that the final thing is I think is important is that it's just not value for money. Like I'm really unclear why universities should charge based on a amount you're going to you're going to earn afterwards, as opposed to charging you based on the quality of services they're actually providing you. Because that's only one metric of doing it. And the standard of teaching is not high. If the technology you're getting is not good, why should you be paying more just on some future projected outcome. In either world in which this works, universities either have no money or you change the way in which people access university in a terrible way. Both worlds are bad, the safety score is better, very proud of folks. Thank the speaker for those remarks. Now call upon the member of government to open the back half of the In closing, we believe that basically universities are either severely underfunded because they charge not enough tuition or free tuition, for example, or just look at Canada, for example, which can't even give money to poor kids uh, to actually help to actually help them get into schools because their tuition rates are so low, there's no money to actually give, or they're too expensive and the debt burden to get into them is inaccessible. We agree with OG's model, which we think was pretty simply laid out. You pay less same or more based on your earnings than the status quo and you do this afterward they're little we get it we finally get what they thought the model was it would have, with three and a half minutes left in the second speech where they basically say it'll be a flat rate per degree that you get after you graduate or before you graduate like, we, like that was still unclear i'm not sure what their model fiat even was like i think that we're pretty clear on what um we're saying as gov so basically we basically we think that like side like because i was pro like free and, and lower tuition and everything Thing. How do you actually fund that? You have to tax the rich. You have to actually get money from the rich in order to pay for these things. We think that this progressive tax is like a lot better when you're actually specifically doing it to those who benefited from this system and are able to then and are then able to give it back to it in many different ways. I'm going to get into two points of extension. First, on global access, really opening this debate up to many different um, variations, showing why in all of them we win. And secondly, on shifting academia and like the sh and like shifting the academic nature. So first on global access. We think that like it's very important to recognize that even in areas with free tuition, even in areas with low tuition, there's the comparative becomes, what am I going to do after I'm done graduated, right? After I've, gra after I've graduated, will I be in a job that I can actually that I can actually go for, or should I just work now instead and save money and build my family this way and not go to college? Recognize that, A, there's a huge pressure to go get that college degree because it's almost impossible to make above $10 an hour without one, but B, it's, we think that a lot of, we think that a lot of parents, for example, will be, will be looking at you, especially in underdeveloped countries where you're not a part of the political or wealthy elite. I think that I think ultimately these parents are going to be saying things like, well, no, you should be saving now, you should be working now so that you can have your family so that you can actually pay for them. You shouldn't be taking this like innocuous degree that like even if you don't have to pay a lot for it, which we think like in the majority of countries do, um, even if you don't have to pay a lot for it, it is still something that is just wasting your time. Because recognize, as like opening properly points out, you can't work a full-time job while you're a full-time student. Like you can't like you can't be making that kind of money. 
what this what this actually does is this go is this goes away, right? This changes that calculus from being okay. Well, we can access it. Uh, we either have to access it now and give up all these earnings to something that actually allows you to be able to say no. You should access this because even if it doesn't work out, you can go back again. You can retrain. You can go. You can go get a second degree. You can figure it out until it actually works for you. Until it actually until it actually helps you. Secondly, on shifting academia. So recognize that currently in the status quo, I'll take you in a minute. Actually, I'll take you right now before I get to the point. Yeah. Why should a university who gives equal facilities to every other student be not be in a position to charge a student who chooses to opt out of a career or do nothing after graduation that money, despite the fact that that individual has received okay, the so same amount? So, so, per, so perfectly timed POI, because basically what I was just about to say is schools currently funnel mass amounts of tuition money from arts into STEM. Why? Because they want to be able to use the, pro, like, in their brochure, they want to be able to tell people, hey, like, there is a high average earning in this school. Little do they know, it comes from, like, 15 percent of the students who are making a ton of money from this and so it doesn't mean that my child on average is going to make this much money no it just means that it's going to go to those little programs this is what happens in status quo right where they're actually where we can, so that they can help pay for recruiting I think that basically like you have I think that basically you have to recognize that like because the majority of these people are art students are students who are quote unquote unemployable on their side of the house this basically incentivizes these universities to make these degrees more employable to make these degrees actually churn out money to make them profitable, right? No, thank you. So basically, like, what, what, like, what does that actually look like, right? Because now you're not incentivized to just churn out degrees. You're not incentivized to just make sure that your graduation numbers are high. You're actually incentivized to go out and make these jobs into something that people like what? and get paid for. No, thank you. I think I basically, like, ba like, basically, what does this look like? This looks like actually like having incentives for the university themselves to actually like do to actually like actively do things to make sure that you're getting that you're getting money after this, right? Let's look at, for example. Um, like like internships, work studying, co-ops, uh, bursaries for your for your research. This looks like partnering with corporations to ensure that there are jobs available for your graduates when they graduate. This looks like all these th this looks like all these things, right? You're actually incentivized a lot more to do that when your funding mechanism becomes this. Getting into the funding mechanism, right? Because they basically like basically like you have to recognize that like a rich person is still going to be rich even if they get a, even if they don't get a degree that's very employable, right? They're still going to be making earnings off of things like their trust fund. They're still going to be making earnings off of their dividends. We can still tax that, right? But se but secondly, like if a poor person becomes rich from this, yeah. then pay it. Then pay some money back. Help some other people out. Let's uh, let's all help each other out. I'll take you in like ten seconds ish. But then basically, like, I, but then also, like you know how much you are getting from your current graduates, right? You can plan it out based off of how much money you are currently getting. This is exactly what Canada tells you about like paying for retirees. It actually, and it, and it actually incentivizes people to keep up pensions and make sure that they can benefit from it too. Your best case world is one in which everyone goes into lovely low depressions like teaching because it's now affordable for them. Why is creating a giant oversupply of teachers and social workers who then can't find jobs or have super low salaries a good thing? Did you listen to a single word I said? I never said the word teacher, for example. I basically, basically what I just said is that the universities are making it so that these degrees, so that these jobs that people are getting are going to earn more than they do in the status quo, right? Like I think that that's what you're actually looking at. We're not saying people are going to take low income income job so that they don't have to pay it back in the future. Because recognize, like, if I'm taking a low-income job just so I don't have to pay back univer like university fees, I think that's like like that's just like not what we said in this entire speech. So I don't know where that came from. But also like Unpaid internships, A, happens less on our side because like, I think people are trying to get jobs and like, trying to work it, but at least we relieve the debt burden of having an unpaid internship, right? Like, at least we actually do that. So I think that basically, like, this makes it so, this makes it so that you're able to actually, like, in, like, you're actually able to make jobs that pay more and that people are actually interested in, rather than having to, like, get their degree and then work at Starbucks, right? So I think that, so I think that basically, this really, lo this really looks like a progressive tax that's actually palatable to the rich, right? Because underneath status quo, we have the fear that taxes will just go down, that the rich will cut their own taxes, that they won't be paying for education as much. This ensures that this money keeps on coming and that it, and that it, and that it goes in. But also people feel better about paying for something that they actually got value out of, right? People hate paying for taxes because it funds things that like they don't find necessary. They find this necessary because it literally gave them their job. Uh, thank the speaker for those remarks, and now call upon the member of opposition to uh, continue the debate.
It's funny that we're closing opposition, and we're going to be the first team to tell you why tuition is charged at all. I think the reason and the principle behind tuition, and this is where we're directly engaging with OG, is not as a form of progressive tax that they point out to be. We think the world may be uncertain, but getting into tertiary education for individuals is a privilege. A privilege and an opportunity that not everyone has the access to. Once within tertiary education, we don't think life is uncertain. We think within college, you're literally in a safe bubble. You have the opportunity to study as much as you want. You have the opportunity to live life in a free way where you're free from the shackles of your parents, where you're free from the shackles of society, where you can fulfill every individual desire you've ever had. And it is your complete desire and your complete choices that determine what happens in college. We think the ones that are successful in college are ones that end up studying in the library, which is, by the way, their own choice. We think people who are successful in university are the ones that pay attention in class. And by the way, all of these people are smart, so there's no necessarily like IQ problem that these people face, because by hypothesis, everyone that goes to tertiary education has that basic requirement. We think at a point in time where you can choose between studying, but also being a part of a sorority, the usual trend is success is based on your choices where you have give, been given an opportunity and you make out of it. What does this mean in principle? It means the tuition you charge from a university is not for the success that this person is given. It is for the opportunity you give. And by the way, this opportunity is given to all people within that space, within that free hub, and you literally allow everybody to enter the library whenever they want, everybody to interact with professors the whenever they want, and allow them to have as much facility to get there. However, ladies and gentlemen, success is not your doing. Success is often an individual effort, ladies and gentlemen, which is to say that you as an individual in university are successful based on how much effort you've put in, what you've done within class, the way you've interacted and yeah. taken an affinity to academia. Which ultimately means the principle is simple. Your crippling success that is given and earned by that individual based on an arbitrary mechanism of like volatility or uncertainty that we're not quite sure exists in the literally the most free and less certain sphere in your life. Whereas you're also telling people who have been given the unfairly free opportunity to be just as su successful that they don't have to give back. Yeah. These are people who've gone to sororities, gotten drunk, have taken bad decisions in life when in college, he's given the proper opportunity to be successful and not pay back at all. We think if moral obligation to pay back exists, it should exist for everybody because the university has given everybody the equal opportunity to be successful. If you've not made the best use of it, that's your fault, ladies and gentlemen, not the university's. Closing. People still want high paying jobs to have cushy and comfy lives later on. You're not crippling their success by demanding that they pay back their tuition in, like, as a proportion of their income. You're just taxing them. No, but I just literally told you that the job you get is also based on your own decision. The only circumstance in which that cannot apply is one in which the economy is itself uncertain, which we think will probably become compensated for, for the progressive taxation yeah. you talk about. I'm not quite sure why the university at that point in time he should be like put at blame for the uncertainty that the university itself has never caused. I'm still uncertain why it's a moral obligation of the university to reduce its harms based on the uncertainty that the economy has that the state is at fault for. We think at worst the state should pay a greater amount of money for it. We don't see the principle of moral obligation in this. That's first. Second response in terms of principle, and this is where OG says, look, it's important because people often want to fulfill their own desires, and like often this is related to academia, and we think at that point in time, it often is harmful for people who want to go in. Two responses. First, they over-glorify how important self-fulfillment is. Which is to say, often, self-fulfillment is a trade-off. You desiring such importance out of self-fulfillment is literally a zero-sum game where your self-fulfillment has deprived someone else of an opportunity that they would have taken up to gain a utile outcome in life and contribute to society, make good decisions. Which is to say, even though it is important to you, Recognize that that opportunity itself is not one that is absent and like given out of free occur. Which is to say, you have to pay back for the individual self-fulfillment you've gained as well because of the fact that it has deprived someone else of the opportunity to make utile outcomes in life as well. So even if self-fulfillment is tough, 
It's a zero-sum game that you have a moral obligation to pay the same amount of money for. We're not quite sure why that itself is important. Not taken. Uh, so that's the moral obligation principle part of this debate. OG's out. CG. Uh, we need to change shits, right? Like, there's this trend that has to be made. Oh, by the way, this is sort of OG as well. They expanded it as well. Um, we need a trend shift, which is to say jobs need to become more employable. The university has to like make an effort to make jobs more employable. Uh, before getting into this short opening. Oh, dope. So the mentally ill and the poor have drastically different outcomes within college. Do you think this is because they're parting at frats, or maybe because of other reasons? Okay, sure. If the poor are underprivileged in life, we think we've accounted for their underprivileged by giving them a privilege, which is why they're in university in the first place. We don't see why, we're not arguing for the poor have a hard life. The fact that they're in university means they have some recourse and have been given certain privileges which a university education has the ability to redress for. Ultimately, within university, even if it is an irrational decision that the poor take within peer pressure, we think the opportunities still exist for them. We're not making it harder for them. Those are arbitrary circumstances that the university has to trade off. Okay, so trend shifts and making jobs employable and why this is hard for academia. I think the opportunity for academia to change its employable jobs is a fucking horrible thing to begin with. Why? Some things just aren't employable. No matter how much you try as a university to make certain subjects employable, they just can't. Imagine AI, like 15 years ago. Are there jobs? Can a university literally make these things employable for society? No. Like At best, you can work for some tech firm that like, does really crazy shit in the future, but you can't. In the process of trying to make jobs employable, you cut down on funding on things such as research behind that subject. You cut down on funding behind things such as better teachers, better evaluation, because you literally have no tuition to do so. What this means is quite simple. The comparative of making education more employable is trading off research that changes the way society functions, that changes the way we view morality, that literally removes arts and liberal arts colleges from and shuts them down because discussions on things such as what is morality is not employable, but you remove that from society and the utile outcomes of that on society. You literally say AI is unimportant because you're living in the 80s. Imagine what this world could be in the future if we don't cut down. Very glad to propose, uh, oppose on this bit. Very glad. I thank the speaker for his eloquent remarks and now call upon the government whip to conclude the government portion of the speaker. their programs just on a base level. Why is this? Because even though we charge tuition and that tuition is difficult for individual people, it is not enough to fund all of the professors and research programs that they want. That means that they have a choice between less like good like academics with worse profs and less readers, which is what CO seems to care about, or hiking tuition and making it more inaccessible to the average person. This is the reality in the vast majority of countries throughout the world, and this is the reality that Alex and I have engaged with. Three themes. First, I'm going to talk about the principle and why I think Alex would be the best reason why this is principally important. Second, I'm going to talk about accessibility, both in university and outside of university. And last, I'm going to talk about the quality of education and give you a realistic status quo where, honestly, we're having a complete reduction in the quality of our education because they're not funded enough by the elite who don't care enough to actually allow us to progressively tax them the way they want. The better alternative is to tax those who are actually in education because they're the ones who are willing to take it because the only way that they can be successful is through that degree. Thus, they're forced to do it and they're willing to do it, unlike um, the elite. Okay, first on the principle. What does OG give, give us? OG tells us it is like principally important because it's a morally just thing to do given the uncertainty of university. I think this is correct, right? But I think that Alex goes beyond this and gives you more important factors. What are those? First of all, um, 
he, he tells you about how degree inflation means that it's becoming more and more critical for the average person to have a university degree in order to just get a job that pays the rent or pays for their basic standard of living. That means it becomes more, less and less tenable to just say, this is a, an opportunity you give you, we give you because society has forces upon you and made it almost mandatory for most people to be able to pay for them and their children to survive. But also, counter pressures exist. Recognize that the fact that you often have to pay off tuition right away or very soon after, no matter how much money you're giving, means that not only you are working against yourself, but your parents are telling you in high school that it's not worth it to try to work towards university because you need to work a minimum wage job right away to sustain your family. That conversation completely shifts when you say, no mom, I think I have a good chance of becoming a doctor or a lawyer or a social worker and get a good wage. But even if I don't, this isn't going to cripple my family, so you should give me the opportunity to do this. You should allow me to study instead of working a minimum wage job afterwards. That's how you actually shift the conversation, not just in the United States, where you're paying 50k a year for university, but also in other countries like Canada, where you're paying five, ten thousand dollars but that's still untenable for, the, for a lot of low-income people. Okay. Um, Opposition responds with like some really weird fiats, right? They tell you you can just do progressive taxation better, or you can do free tuition, or you can do these other things. The problem is, this isn't consistent across the board, and Alex and I would prefer a world in which everybody has access to education, instead of the UK being lucky enough to apparently have a good system, and the rest of us are screwed, right? That's what we give you. It's also really hard to convince rich people to progressively tax them, because they believe it's their earnings, and they just don't like that stuff, and they have a lot of political pressure. But when you say, this is necessary in order for you to attend our university, you will have to pay it back proportional to your earnings. That's when people consent to it because they realize it's a necessary thing to do. Sure. OG says that people will take low paying social work in massive numbers. You guys say that university will push everyone into high paying professions. Who's right? And if you are, why wouldn't the poor person with a passion for philosophy or theology get screwed over when universities cut those positions because they just can't increase income enough? So recognize that under the status quo, philosophy departments across the, the world are being cut under the status quo. They had to tell you when that, why that's unlikely to happen. But also, the, what Alex and I told you isn't you're going to be pushed into high paying jobs. They're going to make sure you have more access to those jobs in the field that you care about, which means more things like funding internships programs, which means actually funding arts programs so that you're more to get a high paying job in the future so that you can give more money to your university. That's the clearest incentive I've probably ever seen in debate round. Okay, um, next, back half tells you principally, we don't charge you for the success, we charge you for the opportunity. I think the POI that front half gives is really good, right? Recognize that there are existing barriers that mean that people don't benefit from university in the same way. First of all, they have to spend money that they actually care about in order to go to that university instead of rich people who barely see it as a drop in the bucket. Secondly, barriers later on in life, such as bias or connections that mean it's easier for rich people to get hired by their daddy's law firm, mean that even in the like afterwards, you're less likely to get hired even if you have the same degree. This means it's not just about charging for success, it's about recognizing the fact that even when you get a job, rich people are more likely to get jobs that are more like or like that pay more, so they should pay it back. Um, sorry, I don't know what that was. Okay, um, they also say it's just like your fault if you don't work enough. I just think this is completely ignoring the barriers that currently exist. I also think it's important to note that rich people who decide to party in the frat the entire time still make earnings afterwards, even if they're philosophers. Why? Because Alex tells you things like trust funds, things like dividends can still be used as like earnings that you like quote unquote, you, like used to pay the tuition like that they pay back, so rich people would still be paying back even if they decide not to work it ever. So we solve that Order. problem. Okay, uh, back half will take you now if you want. Yeah, so by that logic, progressive taxation shouldn't exist either because success, by the way, for different people exists through different metrics. Why do you charge uniform progressive taxation to all people of the same income? So the thing is, like, having more money just means it's easier to get things like healthcare and education and food for your children. So I think that people who have, are better able to obtain those should try to give a little bit money, more money back for other people to also obtain those things. It's just a principle I abide by. Okay, accessibility real quick. Recognize, so Fred Hap tells you this encourages education, but Alex actually gives you the existing pressures that exist for low-income people across the globe to not go to university under the status quo, how this completely shifts the calculus. I already explained this to you. Next thing, they, like, opposition responds with, some things just aren't uh, employable, right? Like, they're, they're just going to cut research, right? This makes no sense, right? They're going, like, under the status quo, they cut arts systems because they can, but they can't completely cut the program. They just massively underfund them because they need tuition from those thousands of art students at their university to pay for all the tech upgrades. The better result is for them to try to 
make more money off of everyone by implementing systems which mean that everybody is more likely to get a job afterwards. That's things like internships, that's things like making sure that they seem the most employable possible ever. This is better for individuals who opt into going to university because they're more likely to get a successful job after and pay it back to the rest of society who maybe can't go to university. Um, back, uh, sorry, front up tells you you're just going to have crippling debt later. This just doesn't make sense. On the comparative, you either don't get an education, you have a minimum wage job where you have to pay your loans just to pay for your kids like food, or you have crippling debt and none of that matters. Lastly, on the quality. I think I proved to you already that this you're not going to have more cuts to art programs because that is the status quo. What you get is an incentive for universities to invest in those programs to make sure that you make the most money as possible no matter what program you're in so they can benefit from you. Proud to for them. Here, here. Thank you, Speaker, for those remarks. Now call upon the opposition whip to conclude the debate. If you consider universities as like every other transactional entity, that they're providing a service and they're getting something back in return for that particular service, you must recognize whether there is any disparity in the service that they give to individuals belonging to that particular university. We think not. We think universities enable access to opportunities to every individual within that university, irrespective of where he or she comes from. And we think individuals, as a consequence of giving everyone the same opportunity, the same service, access to the same professors, and access to the same job opportunities, should be able to give to charge everyone the same amount, irrespective of what they earn later. And we think that is incredibly important, because we think Universities are, are like, are like the, the pathway to tertiary education itself presents the opportunity of individuals to shape their own life and make their own decisions in college. I think that is something we can never ever stop. But we don't think we should arbitrarily uh, like cut back on the salaries of professors, on research funding, on critical infrastructural expenditure based on the arbitrary decisions of opting out of a career that certain students make, of opting into a low paying job that certain students make. We think it's incredibly problematic for the university to survive, not only in terms of solvency, but we think it's incredibly abhorrent, even principally. And we think this is where closing opposition clearly stands out in this particular debate. And we think this principle is like incredibly important. But more importantly, recognize that even if every individual does not like, d like d does not uh, benefit off of university in a particular manner, it is not the fault of the university because it's providing opportunity for everyone equally. But the reason why individuals may behave or like succeed differently after their church, after the four years of tertiary education, is because of intelligence disparities within individuals. Certain individuals might be more intelligent than the other. We think it is not the university's fault that all of the incoming individuals, like within a particular freshman batch, are of different intellectual capacities and of different ambitions from life. We think that's expected, and that that is something that the university should not be paid for. Because ultimately, if that is the system and if practical outcomes is what defines this debate, then universities will end end up taking in individuals only who they feel have a probability of going back and serving in jobs which are likely to bring in economic utility to you, which means that universities which are desperately in need of economic funds to like survive and like do better in terms of a particular subject are unlikely to take in individuals who probably give, give their life to like social service or like quote unquote like unpaid jobs or like less uh, or like less socially utile jobs with less economic opportunities. We think that's problematic. Yes, closing. Okay, it's unclear to me why any university has incentive to cut STEM research or cut technology. Isn't it a better incentive if they can just 
fund things better and you, like maybe even charge like the most successful people more and in order to fund everything. So obviously, no university has the incentive to cut back on certain subjects. They only do so once you pressure them to like have a certain degree of solvency which they can't otherwise afford because they can't charge enough for that subject. This is where Sajid's analysis about particularly critical subjects whose economic utility is unforeseeable into the future is particularly important. Subjects like bioinformatics, but subjects like in artificial intelligence now or even 10 years back require incredibly high amount of funding because that's the money that goes into critical Question. research material or infrastructure that basically paves the way for more opportunities for students like like in within that particular subject the reason why if universities are unable to charge that amount these subjects are likely to die out as a consequence of this and research is unlikely to take place in the same volume and amount and quality that it takes place today Question. is because because you can't foresee the economic like economic uncertainties within that particular subject, because there is no guaranteed income that individuals graduating from this subject are likely to get, universities are going to be less incentivized to follow through with this particular subject. We think that it's incredibly problematic in nature. So what this ultimately Question. does is that you trade off research, you trade off academic exploration into ideas that have less monetary returns. Sajid's analysis about how subjects are likely to more themselves to be economically employable and economically beneficial to students is kind of problematic because not every other student quote-unquote the large number of students who want this particular self fulfillment that you that you talk about out of a particular subject students that want to get into research or want to go into the profession of generating knowledge are unlikely to be benefited by a subject which basically only prepares students for future employment assuming that is possible we think that's incredibly problematic and that taints like that taints academic exploration in a manner that niche subjects disappear and you predominantly have a concentration of resources into subjects and into areas where there have been like a pre like 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 there have been like a guaranteed track record of success and nothing otherwise this is incredibly problematic because it can like, like, like educational opportunities don't expand and a lot of subjects die out, yes. Sure, so best case scenario for you guys, some places will get cut departments and whatnot. Liberal arts institutions will never cut philosophy because they get alumni donations, right? But it's about the poor individuals who have to go to state schools and now maybe like philosophy gets cut from the state school but accounting gets a lot more and now poor people can finally get employed rather than getting a useless I think degree. you're making a lot of points within that particular POI. We don't think a university yeah. can I, like independently survive based on alumni donations here, here. only, assuming they could do so, they wouldn't even charge tuition in the first place because you literally get all the funding possible to like to like uh, to basically facilitate all your subjects in the very first place. In terms of poor people, I think there are already measures within the system to help poor people. For instance, your ability to give huge amounts of financial aids coming for individuals coming from different places, state funding, loans, and all of that, th all of those things which enable poor people to take place. But but in a position where you are given the opportunity of deciding who to take in, you are probably less likely to take an individual from a relatively disadvantaged background because you think that individual is likely to be relatively less unemployable or going to earn relatively less wages as a result like after graduation. Which means because these individuals are unlikely to be as successful as your like influx of like rich elite students who are likely to do better off after university, you're probably going to disadvantage advantage like like disproportionately cut or limit the opportunities to these students not to mention that even in class you're likely to treat students differently based on who is more likely to succeed and you're gonna have a situation where you have continued about like like ab abandonment of individuals who are less likely to succeed and we think that is a disparity that's problematic too because we're principally sound because universities have the authority to charge from individuals who they are paying equally in terms of service, we think we think this way. Thank you. I thank the speaker for those remarks. Uh, invite everyone to cross the floor, shake hands. Uh,